This is the Picard Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about Star Trek Picard, Season 2, Episode 5, Fly Me to the Moon. Welcome back, fellow Trekkies, to episode 5 of Star Trek Picard. It is Fly Me to the Moon. I am one of your hosts, John. And let me play amongst the stars. I am one of your other hosts, Derek. Yes, indeed. (laughs) Yeah, man down down this week. Um, We are, yes. Chris has been taken captive like the gendarme uh, by the Borg Queen. Which is worse, getting captured by the Borg Queen or uh, by ICE and being deported? <laughs> I'm not sure. Is he Rios in this situation or is he some random smoking gendarme from well, France? Well, I-, I guess ha- working for a, a tech company, mm. then it's more the Borg Queen. Yeah, I'd probably worry a lot more if it was uh, the board queen anyway and or any circumstances at all anyway yes unfortunately chris can't join us for our discussion about star trek picard which is spoiler filled as you can probably already tell we hope you've watched episode five before jumping into this podcast because there's lots to talk about number of reveals in this episode yes. and lots of things to get into but before we get into our spoiler filled discussion remember fellow trekkies if you haven't already subscribed please head on over to Mm tvpodcastindustries.com where you can join any federation or confederation supporting podcast player of your choice. You can also send in your thoughts, theories, comments on all things Picard. Just send in your email to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. And of course, we are over on Facebook where you can join our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV Podcast Industries, where we leave a spoiler-filled commenting post uh, where you can put in your thoughts, ideas, and chat with fellow Trekkies on the latest episode. Absolutely. And that email address, feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com, is where you can also send in your answers to the 10 Forward pub quiz. Uh, we have our fifth question coming up later in this episode. If you've missed any of the questions, you can go to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com and there is a Star Trek Picard uh, pub quiz post there where you can get all the previous questions in case you missed any. Yes. Uh, can't wait uh, to uh, see who will win mm-hmm. this this season's uh, pub quiz or 10 forward pub quiz. Yes, yes. See who gets those uh, Picard goodies. But let us get into this episode. Derek, what are some of the episode details? Yep, this episode was written by Cindy Apple. Uh, Cindy worked on MacGyver, the reboot show, with Picard executive producer Terry Masselis. Uh, did two episodes of that show and is now writing her first episode of Star Trek with this episode of Picard. MacGyver! Yes, I love that show. At least the old version <laughs> of the show. I haven't really watched the this new iteration of MacGyver, right. but I loved old MacGyver. I certainly lo- like a lot of the writers that have come over from MacGyver, though. There's uh, there's quite a lot of people yeah, that, have, been that have come from that. Yeah, yeah. And the episode was directed by number one himself, Jonathan Frakes. Once again, coming back to direct his uh, his episode of the season for Star Trek Picard, he directed an episode last season on Picard. He's no stranger to directing Star Trek as well. He's been directing right back to his days on on Next Generation, so and including one of the movies as well. So uh, it's nice to have these assured hands in quite a big episode with lots of uh, lots of characters coming back and lots of um, characters we haven't seen uh, for a long time in the show uh, showing up here. I love it when Jonathan Frakes uh, gets behind the camera mm-hmm. because I, you're always, uh, I should say, in for, you know, it's good hands on, on a Star Trek property, but you always know there's going to be some kind of class reunion yes. going on um, <laughs> in the episode. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for Star Trek Picard, season two, episode five, Fly Me to the Moon? Sure. Returning to the Watcher's apartment, Picard realises that she is not Laris. 
The Watcher, named Talon, reveals to Picard that her mission is to monitor a temporal point. She is here to watch and protect an important person from Picard's past, his ancestor René Picard, and she may be the key to the divergence in the timeline. Meanwhile, Seven and Raffi make a daring rescue of Rios from the evil clutches of ICE, and back at the ship, a mischievous Borg queen tries to force Jurati to be connected by taking a gendarme hostage. Elsewhere in LA, Dr. Adam Soong, whose daughter Corey has a rare genetic condition that causes her blood to react violently to sunlight, is desperate to increase his funding to find a cure. But his dealings with a dodgy military contractor, which sees him working directly on human subjects unregulated and unmonitored, sees his funding cut and his license revoked by the authorities. Meanwhile, Q continues his manipulation of the timeline. But with the unexpected loss of his power, he has to get his hands dirty and manipulate events directly. Pretending to be Rennie's psychiatrist, he preys on her anxiety to try and persuade her to drop out of the forthcoming Europa mission to space. He also takes an active interest in Dr. Adam Soong's desperate predicament and offers a cure for his daughter's condition in exchange for something he needs. As everyone, including Talon, meet back at the Confederation ship, they find that Jurati has killed the Borg Queen, trying to rescue the gendarme who is still alive. But events mean they must focus on infiltrating the pre-launch gala to protect Rani Picard from Q and make sure that she gets aboard the space shuttle for the Europa mission. Jurati, having learnt ancient coding at university, Hmm. gets into the gala to take down the ancient security, so the others can follow. But as the plan appears to be working, Jurati must face the consequences of her deal with the Borg Queen. What a cliffhanger on this episode. I'm not sure exactly what's uh, what happens at that at that ending point there with the Borg Queen and Jurati, but I'm sure we'll talk about it uh, as we get into the episode. But yeah, what a cliffhanger. Oh, definitely. And I think this was fantastic episodes I, I i really enjoyed it it felt really in depth and really getting to some of the meat of the the issues here mm-hmm. even if it doesn't fully explains it it just felt like a, a nice progression down this story and again um just the the different bits and pieces to this were, were just really really good i'm really glad that we got to um the the reason for the watcher oh, yeah. and this potential divergence uh, yeah. for sure and what's going on with Q and his plans yeah yeah yep. i i do also think this is probably the most french episode uh <laughs> so far in the series what with rené being the Chateau Picard still being featured, mm-hmm. and of course Leclerc, the unlucky gendarme. Any uh, really. any fans of uh, a low a low, the uh, the British sitcom about uh, France uh, <laughs> during the war will recognise Rene and Leclerc in there. So, <laughs> so we were laughing about the names uh, that they'd chosen for for our main French people in the episode. <laughs> well, it was interesting as well that the police officer did like light up a cigarette whilst mm-hmm. on duty. Of course, he did. Um, yes, it was. <laughs> Kind of quite an interesting uh, little moment there yeah. for for that. It's uh, only you see too many other police officers in a film or in a TV show yeah. doing that. At least those not in uniform. That's very true, actually. Yeah, I believe there's weirdly there's restrictions on people smoking tobacco in TV shows much more so than any violence or or sex or or drinking. Um, tobacco is pretty much outlawed. So I'd say. The trade-off was, if we have him smoking, then we're going to have to punish him really badly in the next scene, basically. So. Well, there is always the Borg Queen yeah. a la Nicorette patch, I basically. guess, <laughs> um, happening here in she this episode as well. She will cure you of your tobacco addiction, yes. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> So let us get into our points for this episode. We'll start with our general order, our small moment about the episode. Make it so, number one. Derek, what's yours? My small point is just because I wanted to call it out so we didn't miss it. A moment I really enjoyed from the episode is the Borg Queen uh, trying to access the computer. I just thought it was a really interesting setup. She's been left on her own in La Serena, um, 
just, you know, trying to work out what how she can get out of here. She's she's trying to escape from the ship. She's trying to get out of the clutches of Picard and his crew, basically. But I loved how it played out. Effectively, she's overhearing all of these phone calls that are going on. And she's even describing it as voices trans transferring on invisible lines, invisible yeah. wires. Um so she's trying to interpret what's going on in 2024. You know, she's not from this at uh, this century, you know, so she's trying to interpret what it is that's going on. So she decides that she'll access the local phone wires so that she can uh, try and break herself out of this situation. But what I love is the, the fact that she has to go through all the members of the crew in order <laughs> yeah. to access the computer. So she starts off with her own voice, trying to access computer and trying to get the computer to tap into the local telephone tower. But of course, no reaction to the Borg Queen. How would she get access to the computer? Interestingly, she tries Gerati's voice, former partner of Rios, Gerati. Yeah. Uh, he obviously hasn't reprogrammed her ability to access the Confederation version of La Serena. Um, and then tries Picard. Picard also doesn't have access to the system. Picard's voice doesn't have access. The only voice that eventually she's able to use to get access to the system is, of course, Captain Rios, because it's his ship. Yeah, and that's really interesting because as they crash landing and we had that discussion about whether they crashed in or landed in France mm-hmm. or close to L.A., it... Yeah, you were right, John. It was France. <laughs> I know. Um, I, I can't, I'm going to just keep mentioning that. <laughs> but that's it. Picard has to ask... Rios for um to give him access and control. That's right. Yes, yes. And of course, remember now by the end of the episode, the person who had control of the uh, of La Serena was the Borg Queen. If she's no longer able to control the ship, and Rios for some reason isn't able to get back on board, nobody else has control of the ship, right? So Rios is now really important to get back for their mission to get back to the future right yeah definitely so re- just keep that in mind he's not the only one dare i well, say yes. as well yes absolutely yeah i i thought it was really good really enjoyed it but i really like the look of mischief um that comes across the face of the Borg queen yeah. as she is understanding how she might be able to get out of the situation what trouble she's going to cause you know where she effectively puts herself in the role of being a damsel in distress and mm-hmm. um, so i really like that um for sure yeah it was really it was really good fun wasn't it even you know you could tell it's almost like a prank that she's doing call yeah, the cops exactly tell them to come over Gerati is a heavy sleeper as well. The cops are walking <laughs> around her house. There's nobody else in the house. There's an old house that she's in, the, the uh, Chateau Picard, and she's asleep on the couch, n- doesn't get disturbed by the cops walking around, checking everything out, doesn't get disturbed about the Borg Queen with um, shouting over the tannoy, effectively trying to wake up Gerati. And you do get that kind of comedy moment where the Borg Queen raises her voice to go, Gerati, wake up. <laughs> so uh, a fun little, uh, fun little joke there. But it is, it's almost a prank. Yeah. Again, until the spikes come out for the Borg Queen to uh, to capture the uh, the gendarme and effectively almost kill him. Yeah, I, I I thought this was real great horror sequence here. Just mm-hmm. really, really enjoyed it. I love that the police officer Leclerc was what is this? I, I and then he hears the voice, and again, it's that damsel in distress. Follow my my um my voice. Mm-hmm. You know, it really sounded like Freddy Krueger putting on a voice oh, in right. in the dreams, <laughs> yeah. and you know because you know what's going to be at the end of that yes. voice, and you're seeing uh, Leclerc here, you know, doing his duty to protect um mm-hmm. the the citizens of France, and so I, I just those really nice horror sequence here, yeah. uh, and I. You know, there was part of me after our discussions last week about whether it was the Borg Queen that could be in these tunnels that could have dragged uh, Madame Picard, uh, mother of Jean-Luc, uh, from the flashbacks that we've seen. That's right, um, yes. That I, I just wondered whether it was... She was almost leaving a a a nest egg or something of, of, of a Borg in there. Mm-hmm. And it was going to be Leclerc, this police officer. Now we'll, we'll get to how it plays out. Um, but uh, it was just a really good sequence, really building on that tension between um, the Borg queen and Jurassic, yes. uh, which has been really a fantastic yeah. part of this series. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that was my uh, general order, my small point for the episode. John, what's your small point that you want to talk about? Uh, mine is 
the again following on from this i i love the 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 dragging the dead cop gag uh that, that came about here because mm-hmm. effectively after everyone has been doing their thing uh away from the ship they all converge back on the the ship mm-hmm. and we have picard bringing uh talon the watcher yep. uh to to the ship saying this is they, they are really great crew they're they're some of the best I've known. Yeah. Um, as they're dragging, it's not a dead cop. Um, he is clinging on to life, uh, thanks to the work of Jurati. Yeah. But they're just dragging this uh, gendarme across the ship floor to try and get him to, um, so he can be picked up by the police so that he can actually get hospital treatment. Yes. Um, but it looks like they're, effectively doing something highly illegal of which you know talon is not really in that wheelhouse she's quite clear you know she has a simple rule mm-hmm. is that she watches and doesn't interfere absolutely but picard's setup of how great his crew are and then they're dragging a dead police or what appears to be a dead absolutely. police officer. oh no he's he's not dead i'm sure there's a, a good explanation <laughs> yes yeah, exactly that's <laughs> the like, backtrack exactly they've basically knocked him out they have they have given him medical medical attention you hear that from jurati she has fixed him except for his spleen which is over on a box on the side um that's rios's face that's was absolutely, priceless absolutely priceless um and then she's given him something to wipe his memory and they're going to stick him back in his car so he'll wake up. And I guess he'll tell one of those stories like you hear about the UFO encounters where one night I went out to shut up a yeah. card and there was a spaceship there, you know, because he did walk around a spaceship, you know. But I guess she might have something to knock out the entire memory. But he could have those little fragments that, again, you hear from the UFO encounter stories. Well, that's yeah. it. And I, I wondered if that was continued chatter on the airwaves uh, as a result of the ship Maybe. crash landing because it only cloaks once it is downed yeah. on the ground so you could you know france is even in, in 2024 will be a populous um country absolutely and so someone somewhere um has opened up a file down in a basement <laughs> of some federal agency that sounds very x-filesy john definitely <laughs> uh, that is that your uh, your general order yeah that yep. is my yep. general order point i think uh, we can get on to our omega directive our medium point implement the omega directive immediately john do you want to kick us off with your uh, medium point your omega directive yeah my medium point is really uh, seven of nine and raffi mm. um rescuing rios finally yes. you've just said how important he is given he controls the authorization uh on on the, the starship but i just thought you know th- this was really really good and it, it it's less about the 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 breakout uh of rios from the the coach but it was just more about how it came about because you know we we see here that there's a bit of an argument that is developing between Rafi and Seven uh, about whether Rafi is becoming too reckless mm. or uh, Seven of Nine is becoming a bit too careful. I get it. There is the prime directive where you you can't interfere yeah. and you have to keep a low profile. But there is Rafi here who is effectively wanting to transport Rios off the, the moving target that is the coach. Mm-hmm. And Seven is like, we can't do that. Who knows what implications uh, a busload of prisoners and their guards seeing someone phase off a a coach is going to do. Absolutely. But there's a real kind of struggle as to what will happen. And it it does look for a moment that Rafi doesn't really want to hear what Seven's plans are. Yeah. But in the end, I think Seven's provides, you know, a bit more... Uh, hand-to-hand combat and a bit more action where she, they use an EMP blast to effectively stop the bus and Rios is kind of tuned into um the fact that this could be their rescue mm-hmm. and so you know there's a few punch-ups and we get the all, all the um immigrants who are being deported mm-hmm. or something far worse I guess we'll never see that now because we thought they were going to possibly be going to a sanctuary mm-hmm. or some kind of prison camp the sanctuary district yes, um, yes. yeah like uh, from the deep space nine episode that we yeah. talked about last week but they they're rescued here and 
with the rescue, one of the um, one of the uh, immigrants does look like um, Elnor, and in fact, when when Raffi sees this guy getting off the bus, it mm-hmm. is Elnor, yeah, um, and then suddenly realizes that it's not when yeah. he asks, are, "Are you okay?" So it gets play, played by Evan, Evan Gorey as well. Yeah, I, absolutely. Weirdly, I was taking notes the first time. I literally saw the moment where she hits his shoulder and he turns around. And I'm like, oh, I guess he has the same kind of hair as him. But the second time we watched it, uh, of course, it is the actor Evan, Evan Gorey uh, as um, Elnor that Rafi sees. And then he turns around. It's a different actor. So, yeah. Uh, so, yes, of course. I, uh, I I was wondering why she made such a big um, moment of it kind of thing. Oh, guy with the same hair. You know, but she's clearly obsessed and really upset about yeah, the exactly. loss of Elnor. That's exactly why Seven is challenging her about. And it it's before. the tension between yeah. them, the the two of them as to the methods that they're employing mm-hmm. here, and and it kind of brings to an end their attempts at finding the Watcher that they were doing before. Effectively, they've all been sidetracked with the capture of, of Rios. Yes, yes, and um, as well. So it it was you know one of those threads really coming to an end. But it, it is good to see Rios uh, safe and sound and out of the hands of the or out of the evil clutches, as I described, <laughs> uh, of ice. Yeah, they probably wouldn't describe themselves like that, of course. But <laughs> I'm sure they wouldn't. Uh, but no, yeah, good good to have him back. Um, and uh, yeah, the the uh, the tricorder is a uh, a very. Uh, multifunctional tool, isn't it? The Swiss army knives of, of of tricorders, <laughs> I guess. Yes. Uh, I did want to just call out one little thing um, in that scene. We see Pedro, the immigrant that was put on the bus before uh, Rios in the last episode. We see him throw the double-handed punch of Captain Kirk um, at the at the security guard before they get off the bus, after the, uh, yeah. the ice guard, after they get off the, the bus. Um I also noticed that they played a little bit of the original series theme tune when um, Rios was saying goodbye to Pedro and complimenting him. Effectively. Yeah, and because Rios like, actually does the double-handed punch again um, in front of him, saying, nice move. He emulates like, Doing it, the exactly. action again. Yeah, exactly. And then they played the theme tune. I was wondering, what is that supposed to mean? Jonathan Frakes, what have you put into this episode it's, here? Yeah. It, it was a weird one, wasn't who's it? Who's Pedro? Because there's very much this kind of connection that we should know who Pedro is or there's something going to happen down the line that Pedro leads to something else. Or, Definitely. Yeah. And, and as soon as they they flag the same punch again mm-hmm. by of, of Pedro's by Rios, I was like, yeah. okay, that that feels like it's something. That yeah. something is is being sort of Easter egged here. It's certainly... It is certainly... Captain James T. Kirk's uh, double-handed Sign- signature punch, is. definitely. So maybe they were just underlining that, but it felt like a weird underline afterwards. That's all. So I definitely wanted to uh, wanted to mention that as well. But nice to have good old Rios back. But Derek, what is your Amiga directive? This is probably quite a big point for our medium point in the episode. But I want to talk about um, Dr. Sung and his daughter, in here and Q's plan really uh, everything that's going on here we saw at the end of last week's episode the big cliffhanger there was that Q has lost his powers um, and now he's connecting up with Dr. Adam Sung and his daughter Corey Sung uh, played by Brent Spiner and finally the return of Issa Briones, uh in the episode here um, so it turns out that the Sungs have a very long history in the world of, uh, of Star Trek uh, with Brent Spiner playing all of them and he's a geneticist whose daughter Corey has a uh, a problem with the light. The, the sunlight will kill her, effectively, almost vampiric. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he's looking for a cure for uh, for this illness that she has. Um, it's it's interesting. I kind of feel like, given how short the seasons are on um, on Picard, it's kind of odd that we have another member of the Soon legacy played by Brent Spiner coming into the show here. Um, he's played three versions of this character now, or four, I think, even uh, versions of this character. And then along with all the versions of Data and Lore and, and B4 that he's played, it's good to keep Brent Spiner involved in the universe, but it feels weird to have him every time playing Soon. You know, like I know I have ancestors going back hundreds of years, but I don't think every single one of them looks exactly like me. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. sure that they, they don't. <laughs> but, I mean, I think it's just nice shorthand mm. and 
but it's also fantastic to have Brent Spiner back as well. Absolutely. Like, I mean, I, I don't really have that much of, of an issue with that. It doesn't really grate on me. Like, it seems to with you, if I'm, yeah, I'm getting I'm, you right. I, but... I just kind of feel if you have a, a limited amount of story pulling the same storyline that there is a doctor here that's dealing with his daughter and illness or he's dealing with his creations or um, something like that. Having that storyline continuing and going out through Next Generation and now into Picard, it feels like they're using it quite a lot. But what's probably massively different here is that we're finally getting the origins of Sung and why he created yes. what the creations that he did create because it feels like this situation with his daughter is unresolvable. Um, yeah. If he doesn't find a cure for her, she can never go outside. And if she doesn't go outside, how long, how much longer can she live? If she does go outside, she dies. So is there a point going to come that she can't stay indoors anymore? You know, you hear that conversation between the two of them where she's been told multiple times, I guess, sometime soon you'll be able to go out. And she's now questioning, but how, how long is soon? She's starting to say, how long will it be until I until I go out? Um, so of course he's looking for the funding to continue his research, trying to to um, to get the money together so he can continue to find this cure for his daughter. But he's been so obsessed with this that he's fallen in with the wrong people, and that leads to him not only losing the possibility of further funding for this yeah. essential work that he's doing, he also loses his license to practice any kind of genetics. Yeah, at all, absolutely. I, I I really enjoyed this, and I think it it I think as you say it, it's the it, it's the start of the Soon legacy yeah. in 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 Star Trek. But I think as well it's it's the interaction with Q here for me. Oh, absolutely! Because it drives Q's storyline forward, but it, it shows the results of um of q lo losing his powers mm -hmm. you know he has to get his hands dirty he has to intervene in a more physical way he can't just i mean he always has done that but he can't just click his fingers and something will happen yeah uh, and his thoughts can can pass over he has to physically intervene here and this is and it it shows the predatory nature of q that he's you know feasting on the the desperation yeah. of uh, adam soon here he's effectively just lost his career any chance of him developing a cure for mm -hmm. his daughter and he effectively he's living in pretty decent looking house so i guess in time he loses all of that as he has no money coming in well, yeah. and, and he has nothing to fund his research. So I thought this was um, really good seeing that predatory nature. I loved how Q sort of contacts him. The scene in the cafe was just glorious was with the really two good. of them. Really good. Uh, all of that um, Q being theatrical with his, um, you know, time has abandoned me and there's no, there's not much left. You know, he's being grandiose. He says, I am the evolution of stardust, which I particularly that's liked. Really, um, yeah, that's really uh, good. He also quotes the very, very famous quote from the Holy Book Gita. Uh, he quotes the I am death, destroyer of worlds, yes. really famously used by Oppenheimer. Yes. Um, around his atom bomb effectively. So does Q now know? this is going to set us on the path for the future. Uh, when we originally went to uh, that alternate timeline that Q brought Picard to, we saw the statue of Adam Sung. So he is clearly the father of that future. Yes. Um, so simply trying to save his daughter has done something that has led to that that timeline, I guess. Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, and, you know, there is, in the same way that Jurati and the Boar Queen have connected and and. A, a deal has been done between the two. Here we have a deal between Adam Soong and and Q. Mm -hmm. Um, in in terms of for Q, Soong is his lifeline. Yeah, and it's not the only person that he's having to manipulate directly. We see him doing that with Picard's ancestor mm -hmm. Rene as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, the deal here is that Q will give him the cure for his his daughter yeah and in exchange all we know so far is have you ever heard of the name picard doesn't say rene yeah that's true and certainly doesn't say jean-luc yeah but what 
What do you want him to it, do? Is it Rennie? Because initially I thought it was a two-pronged approach by by Q to prevent Rennie from yeah, possibly that's exactly boarding what I yeah. um, the, the Europa Missions shuttle. Yeah. So it, it, I, it could be that, mm-hmm. but he doesn't call out Rene Picard That's true. specifically. But it, I'm guessing it is that. Um, yeah. But you just never know uh, with these ha- how that might uh, might play out. But yeah, but I guess with the pre-existing relationship between Picard and Sung, he knows Sung. He knows all of his history. He knows everything that's going on there. So I guess with that pre-existing history, Q could absolutely be using a Sung to head off Jean Luc potentially. Yeah. You know, I, I think the other interesting thing is with Adam Sung is that it looks as though first and foremost he is a geneticist. Mm-hmm. And um, whilst that, I think, in the very far future, 400 years from now, yeah. that is also applicable by the sounds of it to robotics in his world. Yeah. I was like going, oh, this is a, a di- there is a difference here. Yeah. Um, in the sense that he's a geneticist, not um, involved with robotics or cybernetics mm. or um, that kind of research line. Yeah. But nonetheless, he does seem to have a fairly bespoke... Uh, he, he seems to be able to handle technology well because yes. I thought the drones and the the kind of field shield mm-hmm. for his daughter, uh, Corey, was really, really good. And it, it seemed to match the planetary protection... Um, that we saw on the Confederation yes. planet as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, to block out the intensified solar rays as a result of um, the environmental breakdown. Mm. Yes, so a big connection there with uh, someone that's highly sensitive to solar rays um, in in uh, Cor- Corey. Um, really good to see Ace Bonus back as well yes. uh, in the show. And I have to call out this connection that I found as well, I, I will not take ownership for this one. I didn't come up with this one myself, but I have to call out this connection because I wouldn't have gotten it. Um, it's been a while since I've seen season one. But back in season one, we saw that Data had a painting of the character of Soji and Daj. So there was a connection between Data, this this uh, android creation, and Soji and Daj, played by Issa Brionis yeah. last season. And he was called, the painting was called Daughter. Um, so interestingly, this season we're seeing Issa Brionis to play the daughter of Dr. Adam Sung. So Data was painting the daughter of the original creator or the original ancestor, effectively. So a nice connection running through from season one, and finally an explanation as to why daughter, the, the painting by Data, looks like Issa Brionis, looks like Soji and Daj in season one. So kind of a, a retroactive uh, connection from season yeah, one to season two. Definitely. I liked that. was kind of cool. Yeah, it was. It, it was really good. I... Th- I Really enjoyed um, all of this, and I think yeah. with the with Q involved as well in that amazingly good um, restaurant scene, yeah. it it was just yeah spot on. I, I love it when Brent Spiner kind of swears, and yes. just when <laughs> the, the that initial meeting where it's like you know I'm contacted by so many different crackpots, whether yeah. it is neo fascist groups or crazy rich people who want their cats cloned yeah really you good. know and and then of course q comes out with time has abandoned me and mm-hmm. and soon goes there we go again and yeah. he, he he's just really kind of so not data and i love it when he's not data yes as well as when he is data i like data but yeah. i love that contrast and absolutely. i just always have done certainly in the star trek world absolutely i felt like there was almost a slip of john delancey um like he's, he does such a great job as q especially in that scene but when when brent spider curses at him there's almost a slip of John Delancey going, oh, wow, oh, uh, <laughs> another member of the cast of Next Generation has cursed at me because Picard did as well yeah. <laughs> earlier on in the season. There's almost that moment where he's taken aback by the uh, by the character, I guess, of of, uh, of Adam Sung and, and the way that he's speaking to him. So uh, I thought that was quite funny, but a really good scene overall. And don't get me wrong, it is just literally the concept of having another Sung in the show is all is it was all I was questioning but I do love Brent Spiner. Anything they could do to bring him uh, into the show, I love. So uh, so yeah. no issues with the actual uh, execution of it, let's say. Yeah. 
Well, let us get on to our third moment, our big moment, the Prime Directive. We must face the ramifications of the Prime Directive. All right, John, what's your big moment for the episode? Um, it, it, it's kind of two bits, in, in a sense. Uh, it, it's Nope, your big moment, John. Only one. Now, Chris isn't here. You can have two. It's fine. No, it's not. I, I think, first of all, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed the opening, actually, of hmm. Picard meeting who we think is is Laris from last episode, uh, but the Watcher coming into her apartment, but that being interchanged with the 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 simulation that Rene Picard is yes. doing, and just having the the explanation here, you know, Rene Picard, uh, a serial Picard overachiever, but has um you know has certain struggles here in the form of anxiety Mm -hmm. and depression, which again, just showing the sort of the predatory nature of Q again, he he predates on this by pretending to be her psychiatrist during the pre-launch final um, psych assessment Mm -hmm. and, and, and is actively trying to, talk her out of of actually going on the mission oh cute and, and you yes. see <laughs> yeah, exactly and but you, you you know you have before this just you know a great interchanging of uh renny picard's introduction here yeah. along with talon's uh introduction here and we get to find out that the watcher you know really has this single rule that I will watch. I don't intervene. That she is there for a singular purpose, mm. which is to protect one person, which is Jean Luc's ancestor, Rene. And I, I just really, really enjoyed this. And yeah. it was kind of quite highbrow, really, but I liked it and I liked how it worked into the final sort of part of this episode with uh, Picard and the Watcher because. Talon also describes herself as a supervisor as well. And this is used by Picard to kind of figure out now that he knows that it's definitely not Laris, that um, it is um, that, you know, there is records of kind of higher beings coming in and interjecting into the, the, the timeline or the time periods. Uh, he references a Gary seven, uh, from the Kirk era. Yes, yes, Gary Seven uh, from second season of uh, of the original series of uh, of Star Trek. Gary Seven was yes somebody who had the assignment to monitor over Earth. Yeah, I think it was supposed to be an, a, a spin off of Star Trek at the time that he was going okay, yeah. to be someone left behind on Earth to watch over them. Effectively, I find it interesting this idea of the Watcher that is Talon that she's been watching Rene since she was born. She says she's been at it for twenty four yeah. years, and her main priority is to protect her but she can't interfere and Picard is sitting there telling her that in three days time something massively bad is going to happen here either she'll die before or she won't get aboard the space shuttle and Talon's response is well if she chooses not to get in the space shuttle then it's fine I'm here to watch and observe and you're going but you're here to protect her timeline I guess there's a reason you've been assigned to her you need to read the clues and yeah. follow it. And so. Picard is, we have to work strategically here. Mm. And ultimately, they 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 do. And I thought this was the really nice part of Picard and Talon then, was as they're all assembled on the ship, mm-hmm. it had a heist feel to oh, absolutely. it uh, of what we need to do and when we're going to do it. Yeah. This very extravagant pre-launch gala ball yes. with it has an obscene level of security. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I get it. It's It probably deserves high security, but having been face recognized throughout an entire evening, mm-hmm. uh, even if you are a guest, I'm like going, that's a little intrusive. <laughs> and um, I, I, I just loved how um, Picard says, you know, we, we have this plan. Um, we But there's still very much an uncertainty about what it is that they're going to protect mm-hmm. um, Rene from other than Q, but what's he going to do? They don't, they can't really foresee that or whilst this Europa mission is chronicled by the Federation and yep. is seen as being an important step, 
there's nothing particularly except for um that Rene persuades her um commander that there is this sentient life that they bring aboard and bring back to Earth. Yes, so, that's an interesting one. Yeah. So it's a, a real interesting one. Yeah. But that doesn't seem to really switch Picard on to say that is where the divergence could happen. Because I was trying to think about it along the lines that she effectively allows for humans to not be afraid of sentient life but I think it's only a microorganism. So, see what I what the way I put together was, yeah, it was like the discovery of the potential of water being on Mars led people to think there were possibly other inhabitable planets out in the galaxy. Potentially, this discovery of Rene's in 2024 has encouraged humans to think that there are sentient life forms out in the galaxy or out in the universe as well now. So another big change for the space race. Exactly. Really. With, yeah. with Rene not being there, there is no chance that this organism that she has found on Io, which Picard says she believes it to be sentient, That's right. is brought back. So with someone else at the helm, they don't even recognize that or they're, they have an aversion to it. Mm. And so, but by bringing it back, there is, yes, this... The, the, this whole dialogue introduced on Earth that there could be other sentient beings in the galaxy that they need to try and find. Yeah. Whereas if if it never comes back and they never see this, yeah. that then it, it's still very inward looking, very insular, very exactly. human dominated. Yeah. And so therefore when they do have space propulsion and, and go out into the stars it is humans first uh, and and so that's how i was exactly. thinking that yeah. it could be the divergence but again at the moment that's not really something that uh picard feels is important i mean he says it's an important point in in the history mm -hmm. but that there is a lot of chaos in this time and the records are wildly out I mean, it's interesting because we would say that about, say, um, you know, medieval history. Mm -hmm. And and he's saying it here that, you know, maybe it just wasn't recorded well enough for them to understand that they knew it was sentient. So, Or going back to Guinan's point, um, whatever people say is true in this timeline, it's only two years away, well, <laughs> but true. whatever people say may be true, may not be true. So, uh, so real true facts from this timeline are difficult to get at. Maybe that's the, the kind of underlying jab of Dig it. Here, yeah. um, but as, as we mentioned before, you know, this idea of first contact coming in, in 40 years time, you know, this could be what pushed the hu human society onto we're not alone in the galaxy where we need to think of ourselves as one planet going out and exploring the universe. This yeah, and is, outward and embracing yeah. rather than inward and sort of defensive. And exactly what Guinan was complaining about and wanting to leave the planet. So, yeah. um, so while maybe in the history books it's recorded as a very small moment in human history, Rene finding this um, sentient life form on another planet maybe the knock-on effect of it is, has massive impacts on on the creation of the society like we've seen in star trek so uh so that I, I really like it it's just a throwaway line from picard but it could have major implications for uh for humans in the future i like that yeah ab absolutely cool. um and and we we see then um you know the plan this this plan being put mm. into action oh yes to infiltrate uh, at least to get Jurati into the the gala ball, yes. so that she can then. And I, I really did enjoy her talking of the coding uh, at this stage being ancient coding mm -hmm. uh, semester or, or lecture series at, at university. So yep. I thought that was a nice little moment as well. Yeah, and um, so that they can sort of circumvent all this security absolutely and in the um the true kind of nod to oceans 11 we're not let into what her plan is so we think that Girati is uh, surreptitiously getting in using um you know forged documents and getting in and gonna hide herself in there but actually her plan was to get caught and brought up yes. to the room we don't know anything further than that we don't know what the next step is to get the rest of the crew of la serena into that party 
but we know that this was her plan. Yes. So, uh, so I like that. I like that they did the proper nod to those kind of heist movies where even the audience doesn't know what's going to happen, even though they've made a plan as a, as a crew. So uh, interesting to see what happens. But there's one little wrinkle in that plan, isn't there? Oh, yes. A, a very big, borgy wrinkle. Yes, and I guess that kind of brings us on to uh, my big point for the episode. Actually, not a huge amount to say on this because we kind of covered it throughout the episode, but Jurati and the Borg Queen is big enough to have its own point in in this discussion of Picard. Um, it kind of kicks off with the capture of the gendarme where she calls Jurati in and Jurati makes a choice. I totally thought this scene was setting up that Jurati killed the police officer. He just discovered their spaceship, effectively. Yeah. Um, that, that had come from the future back in time and the importance of the Borg Queen she's responsible for getting them back to their own time and finishing off this whole adventure effectively so when she shoots that gun and it goes to black I just thought it was going to come back and we'd have Jurati burying the body of a police officer outside the, outside the spaceship before anybody gets back you know um, no, agreed, but agreed. the fact that she shot and killed the Borg Queen is pretty huge it, it really was. She, um, she decided that she would still be uh, take the right choice and not kill the innocent one. She, she'd take out the Borg Queen, even though we've had that manipulation of the Borg Queen throughout the season so far, even though it could possibly mean they're stuck here in this time um, forever. She's taken out the Borg Queen. She shot her. Um, I kind of love there's a, a touch of a line that she says, after killing her, saying she's just like us, I shot, I shot her, and she died. Like, just, yeah, there was the weak point yeah. where you you don't have the 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 metal armor and, and yeah. the metal parts of her. Yeah, yeah, I guess I guess an up close shotgun uh, blast will will probably do that. But we get the scene replayed later that the Borg Queen didn't die immediately, and um, she's effectively transferred some of her consciousness fi- into Jurati. Um, I guess that pre-preparation that she's done with the 10 or 20% um, assimilation that Jurati got from the Borg Queen is part of it. We see as she's dying, Jurati's feeling the pain of it already, even before the Borg Queen transfers something over into Jurati's body. Well, that's it. It was like she was injecting her with the Borg Queen essence Mm. or something, like it's Christian Bjorg um, or something (laughs) like that. No, I mean, it was, but... It was really good moment, but it, it was a that final moment where you get that realization of, of what's happened after she's shot at uh, the the what we you know police officer and the Borg Queen, yeah. uh, bef- and in that small intervening period before everyone's back on the ship, and, and we see that she's killed the Borg Queen. I mean, even just when. Rios and everyone is back there. You know, Agnes just is covered in blood, and she says, "I hated shooting her." Mm-hmm. That there is this whole um, love hate relationship. It's completely dysfunctional. Oh, yeah. in, in some respects, at least it's dysfunctional whilst they're separated and not connected. Yes. Because you know, when she's there with the double barrel shotgun. The, the, I mean, the, the Borg Queen is, is basing her, you know, she says, you are utterly alone. I've mm. seen it across all timelines, yeah. across all spaces. You are always utterly alone. I'm the only person that really knows you. And, um, you know, I could take this body of Le Clerc, the, the gendarmerie, mm-hmm. but I want yours. Um, and, you know, playing on that loneliness of Jurati, of imagining being connected with every intimate hope shared um and you know that could be you you yeah. could have belonging you could have connection um but if you don't want to have that i'm getting out of here anyway so i'll take the clerk yeah um and as you say she shoots the queen and I, like yourself i thought it was going to be the police officer because yeah. of how important the ball queen is to the the, the time travel yeah, here. exactly. But then when we see um, the Borg Queen whispering away into Jurati's ear, mm. and I, it was kind of slightly foreshadowed, actually, when I think about it, because there is, is the great moment where you've got the two security people 
in the monitoring room yeah. looking at all the cameras and I think one of them says something's up with the red dress. Yeah. She's talking, to herself, talking to herself all the time. And of course yeah. she has an earpiece in talking to yeah. Picard. And um, I also liked it because you always see people with the earpiece talking to themselves and how that's not picked up, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, anyway. On camera, yeah. But you're right, she could have also been talking to the Borg Queen. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and just that moment where the Borg Queen is sat next to her and you're like, okay, is this just Jurati's mind? But it is more than that because of this connection and yeah. certainly the connection um, that you see the Borg Queen directly make with the injection of her little sort of prongs yeah. uh, into the side of... Um, Jurati's face but you, you see how this relationship now that they're unconnected is not working you know mm-hmm. the the queen's surprised that she has shot her and um, but Jurati is defiant you know she doesn't it, it's almost get out of my head now at this stage yes you know that it, looks like that's not going to be a possibility no. and i think we are on path to exactly as we've been guessing since the second episode that Jurati is going to be the new board queen at this point this is the um path that she's on because she's now been injected with something from the board queen so i, I am guessing uh we were right about the uh the cliffhanger towards the end of the season yeah i think it's looking like that i I, I think yep. the only thing still for me is just, is it that quick? You know, is she at a level or a threshold of the connection previously between her and Jurati? You know, has that left Jurati at a threshold where simply that caressing touch of her cheek with the injection, unless that is a complete data dump mm. that's happened, just because it took so long to get to like 20% or whatever it was. So... Um, but it still affected us, so maybe that's enough. Uh, maybe it's just well. I, I remember we we are in episode five of ten, so the the point would be that maybe over the next few episodes, as the uh, whatever it is wriggles its way inside Jurati's brain, that she begins to turn more and more towards yeah. becoming the Borg Queen. You could do it slowly over a few episodes. Certainly, it's as soon as she puts the big pressure cooker on her head as a hat, and <laughs> exactly. everyone will go, "Why are you, you doing that?" You know she's Jurati? Borg Queen. Then yes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's it. That's what the other big epi- big moment from the episode. Uh, any notes that you want to call out, John? Any any little points that you want to call out from the episode? Um, no, no notes uh, from from myself. I just have one that I want to call out, just a note that uh, that we should really mention, just Q taking on the position of Rene's therapist and using the the cartoon version of Sigmund Freud's voice when he's talking <laughs> to her, pushing her into uh, giving up this this idea of being a, a, a captain on this spaceship, effectively. Um, I just thought it was hilarious. It's a really funny uh, bit from uh, from John Delancey to use that voice. He doesn't need to. He could use his own voice. He doesn't know who's he, who he is, but he's disguising it with this uh, Sigmund Freud voice. I thought that was quite <laughs> yeah, funny. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but Derek, uh, what did you think of Star Trek Picard Episode 5, Fly Me to the Moon? Do you know, there's so many great things in this episode. I did really enjoy it, but there's just a couple of things that are really niggling, and they're they're quite they're quite open and unable to be solved after the episode is over. So which just kind of annoyed me. So it kicks off the episode with Picard thinking that a woman without any Romulan ears is Laris. So he should have noticed that instantly. She doesn't have the Romulan ears. That's probably not Laris. And they have a discussion about it. There's no real resolution to it other than she's not Laris. She's got a different name and she's a watcher. But she looks exactly like looks it. Looks exactly like yeah, it. With, no, the pointy with ears, no explanation. Yeah. And they even have Rafi coming to Picard and, and they make, make a joke out of it. And Picard goes, it's complicated and moves on. You only really do that if the audience knows why she looks like Laris. You only have the joke with another member of this cast coming up and going, can you explain to me now why she looks like Laris? You have that joke because it is complicated, but we, the audience, know And he's not going to explain it again to the other character. So it feels really unusual that they haven't put some kind of explanation in there. And because there's so much in this episode of, like, having Brent Spiner coming back as a soon and Isbrionis coming back as uh, another connection to the soon family and Eva Evangoria coming back as the version of Elnor that 
Rafi sees, having all of that in the episode, and then adding in Laris, who looks like Laris, but isn't Laris, is Talon, is somebody else, but we're not going to explain in the episode. All of that together made that that a little bit too much in the episode. So while I loved the movement in the story, loved learning about Q, loved the uh, the whole thing going on with Jurati and the Borg Queen, I felt that stuff needed to be resolved, it needed to be written into the episode better. Yeah, I, I, I can see that for sure. And th- there's part of me wondering, is it, you know, it's, it's just shorthand for it's soon um, and having Brent Spiner oh, it and, is, totally. and the same with Corey or, yeah. you know, but maybe the Laris thing. I think that's the more important thing um, is why use the same actress to be the watcher yeah. and also um, Laris, um, you know, back in um, at the start of the, the series. So yeah. I, I, and, I was just wondering whether it's something to do with the time travel in the same way that Guinan can pick up or feel the echoes of words that are going to be said mm-hmm. to her in that present. I think with the Elnor thing, that's something within Rafi's mind, but it could be that the time travel is affecting the minds of this crew. I don't know, and I agree, it needs to be, um, there needs to be a little bit of explanation, particularly around Laris. And and I feel there's going to be an explanation around Laris, don't get me wrong, I know, I know we didn't get it in the episode, but it's just how everybody moves on from it to serve the story is more my challenge. So, same, same thing with Jurati shoots the Borg Queen, everybody arrives back in the ship, and no one's screaming going, we're never going to get back to our future. Like, Rafi, her whole mission since the beginning of this of this uh, arc of the season has been to save Elnor she has to get back to the future for that to happen and all the, all we see in this episode is Jurati going oh I've killed the Borg Queen she was her only way home and then there's the gag about them carrying the dead the possibly dead <laughs> police officer out of the ship it's like somebody should have been talking about it it should have been on screen Picard should have had a moment where he goes what are we going to do about the Borg Queen? Well, we'll have to put that to the side for the moment because we need to do this or something, some kind of mention of it. But even when they're all sitting in Chateau Picard, nobody mentions that the Borg Queen is dead at all. So I wonder if the reason why there's so many coincidences and so many of the same faces that are coming back up, will it be explained that this is something that's being put into Picard's mind and that's why there's so many people connected to him right here? It still hasn't been explained why only the crew members of La Serena were pulled back into this alternate universe right back in in episode two, you know. So, will it, it, are all of these supposed to be cues to us that this is going on in Picard's mind, as opposed to it all happening the way it normally does in in Star Trek? I don't know, but as it stands, and in episode five, I hope a lot of this stuff gets resolved in the future. But as it stands, there are just a couple of things that happened in the episode that just need to be just kind of waved away, as opposed to written into the episode like their episode storyline yeah no um, i can definitely see that i can definitely see that yeah how about yourself john what did you think of the episode overall? Uh, i i really liked this episode uh, an awful lot i in fact i i didn't allow that to really um sort of bother me mm. in, in a sense I, I just took the the pure um enjoyment mm-hmm. of of this episode for me but i i, I think you're right i think it there needs to be an explanation, especially around Laris. Yes. Not Elnor, and soon I don't really need to, I, I don't need to worry about that either. Um, but I think with Laris, absolutely. Um, because that's one moment where they could have, if they haven't cast someone in that role, there must be a reason. So I guess there it is, will yeah. come out later. Yeah. And um, so, I I really really enjoyed this. Um, I I was giving it four and a half smoking gendarmes right. out of five. Um, Very I just liked how we got to finally meet the Watcher. I think you're right. I said questions over why uh, the Watcher looks exactly like Laris, but I love the interaction between Picard and Laris. Um, and to be honest, the urgency of this situation of you know three days and counting mm-hmm. that to me felt the reason for a lot of this having to to move forward um because 
Otherwise, we're going to get the Confederation. I mean, even with the death of the Borg Queen, mm-hmm. what can they do? Um, she's dead. She's died. Um, and they know from the record that there are examples of where this is, the time travel has happened yep. without. So really enjoys um, just the interaction of Picard with Talon, the Watcher. Um, I... Glad that Raffi and Rios are, and uh, Seven of Nine are back on the ship, that they're all back together as a crew. I love the introduction of Rennie Picard and how that was uh, interchanged. I think we knew that um, a Soong was going to be coming um, because we had seen his hologram in, in the Confederation Massive as well statue, as the yeah. Federation. Yeah. So it's great to finally see him. And I loved how Q was involved with Soon and with Rennie uh, and how that's driving this urgency forward. Mm-hmm. And the icing on the cake for me is the relationship between Agnes and the Borg Queen. Yeah. Um, it was just awesome. And I really want to see how this plays out. And I guess that ultimately is going to be their way back in, in some respects. Oh, absolutely. Um, yep. it, it is the the essence of the Borg Queen that has been piped into um, Jurati. Mm-hmm. So I really enjoyed all of this and I'm just excited to move to the next one. So yeah, I give this four and a half smoking gendarmes out of five. Um, and uh, yeah, really kind of enjoyed it. Excellent, excellent. Halfway through the series now, John. Only five more episodes to go. I know. Uh, can't wait. Yeah, I think we need a drink though. I think we do. Let us go forth um to the 10 forward pub quiz and for this week's question so it's question five of ten uh the question for this episode how many seconds does q predict it will take for adam soon to sit down to hear his offer oh i think that's the, probably the biggest scene for everybody from the episode yeah. is, is seeing People brent spiner and uh and John Delancey together in that scene. So that's a pretty good one. I like it. Get all the answers together. Email them in to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com at the end of the season or as you go. That's whichever way you want to do it. That's fine. And our wonderful fellow trekker with the highest number of answers correct will get some Picard goodies winging their way to you. John, do you want to give them the question one more time? Certainly. How many seconds does Q predict it will take for Adam Soong to sit down to hear his offer? Excellent. And as I mentioned before, you can also go over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com where we have all the questions uh, up up there. Uh, there is a page there. I was going to say where we have all the answers up there. We don't. <laughs> just the questions. Just the questions. But pop over there if you've missed any of the questions so far. Yes. Uh, I think it's on to our feedback to boldly go where <laughs> no one has gone before. Um it is the feedback section. We'd love, as always, to hear from all our fellow Trekkies. Uh, you can send that in at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com by email. You can uh, leave comments in the spoiler post on our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV podcast industries. You can also send in your own voicemail to us. Just head on over to our website uh, and you can record up to 90 seconds of your thoughts uh, about the week's episode. Uh, Just use the right-hand side tab uh, on our website. Absolutely. Our first piece of feedback comes in from Richard Blaze over on Facebook. Uh, Just after episode four, he says, enjoying the series so far seems quite formulaic at times, but it's Star Trek and that's always a bonus. Now, I thought Jurati would become the Borg Queen since their very first exchange in the Confederation lab. However, I'm now wondering whether the Borg Queen is actually Picard's mother. It would also explain why she knew what to say to him. Ooh, speculation crazy. (laughs) I <laughs> love it, Richard. Uh, you never know. Um, you know, it's not it's not a foregone conclusion that Gerardi is going to become Absolutely. the Borg Queen. There's a little more push towards it in this episode for me. I feel it, it's almost there. But you never know. There could be a big twist. And it's, uh, it's Picard's mother. Is, there really is. It's taken, yeah. Yeah, I think there really is. I, I think there's still enough loose ends um, mm-hmm. to not make it uh, certain. Because 
there is still that flashback that is haunting Picard exactly. of his mother being dragged away into into the darkness. And, and yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. Um, I mean, it looks pretty severe. And he hasn't opened up about this to the rest of the crew yet. Exactly. Um, but I think the fact that Gerardi is also spending loads of time at Chateau Picard means that she has a deeper insight than most other people into the history of Picard. So she could absolutely hear that phrase from Picard. Uh, Look up at the stars is what my mother told me at one point, you know. Um, So she could keep that uh, when she does become the board queen. But you never know. It's a, I love speculating on this show. Exactly. I I think you're right. They've been on the ship for together whilst the other three were away. So Mm -hmm. there's definitely time there for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So thanks so much, Richard, uh, for uh, your feedback there. Absolutely. Thanks, Richard. We also got some feedback from uh, Matt Murdock over on Twitter, who says the first cafe scene between Brent Spiner and John Delancey ate up so much scenery that the rest of the episode felt irrelevant by comparison. The rest wasn't, of course, but in the moment, it sure felt like it. <laughs> Definitely. It was a standout so scene yeah. uh, in in this uh, episode. Yeah. Uh, really, really good. Great to see the two of them together again. Really yeah. good. Great stuff. Thanks, Matt. Uh, also on Facebook, we got some feedback on episode five. Dr. Bob Phillips says, gosh, the new Borg Queen is seriously hot. <laughs> that was a cracking episode with Ocean 6 meets Prison Break meeting Don't Say a Word. The only unbelievable bit was the ICE agents hadn't bothered to learn Spanish. <laughs> Liking the gang all back together. I still think the sexy doctor is coming back in episode seven and that we will see the space elf resurrected. But currently my main wondering is how to get soon from genetics into AI to recreate his daughter in the prime timeline. Mm. That was exactly what I thought as well. And um, that certainly um, there is going to be a break in the tradition of the soon family with having a long history of research in genetics moving into artificial intelligence. Mm. Um, but maybe it, it's the biology of the brain that they will be uh, researching. Do you know, I did notice something on the second watch, though. When um, Corey is going for her swim that she's wanted all along and says, oh, I'm learning, I'm learning in the pool, she says, what was my mother like at swimming to Dr. Soon? And he gets this kind of look on his face. Yes, I did notice that. As if, yes. uh oh, maybe I don't know who the mother is. Yeah. Um, so we know the inventions of Soong are very similar to humans and they have a full circ- circulatory system because that's what we've heard from Picard. He's almost exactly like, uh, like any other human effectively, but he is human made by Dr. Soong. So is Corey really a, uh, a, a human? Is it really his daughter? Um, that's true mm-hmm. maybe the the cure is actually a problem that he has to deal with but i noticed yeah. the same look the strange look on uh adam sung's face yeah. when asked about um his wife effectively and her and uh, Corey's uh mother yeah so maybe he doesn't have to move from genetics to, to ai maybe he is he has AI plus genetics. Yeah, he. You, you might be. You mm. might be right there because, as well, he's been involved with a dodgy military contractor, yep. and he's been using human test subjects. Uh, it could be to do with cybernetics uh, in terms of lost limbs and how Maybe. you know. So you, you you do think there's something dodgy there because of that question about um, her mother. Yeah, for yep. sure. Excellent stuff. Thanks, Dr. Bob, for your feedback. Yeah, thanks so much, Bob, for the feedback. We got some more feedback on Facebook as well. Uh, One more piece from Heather Wallace, who says, Oh, Agnes, I know you feel isolated and alone, but rushing headfirst to someone who says that the only one who understands you is not the way. All that matters is that you understand you. Fight the Borg Queen, fight her. It's really disturbing seeing both the Borg Queen and Q manipulating vulnerable people, although at least the Queen doesn't have a ridiculously fake accent. Seriously, how did Q convince anyone at NASA that he was legit? I'm impressed the show is handling Rene's mental health issues with honesty and so far sensitivity. Anxiety and depression can be paralyzing and they can affect anyone. It's hard though seeing Rene seek help only to be manipulated. This series is really showing how evil Q can be. Previously, he's been capricious, but this is a dark turn. 
Speaking of accents, how do French communities feel about the Picards all having English accents? <laughs> Excellent, Heather. Thanks for that. I suppose they kind of wave, hand waved that away, didn't they, last episode where they said the Picards had all left France and now come back for a couple of hundred years. So uh, they all uh, escaped and went over to the to England um, during World War II. So I guess at the moment, the French communities have to put up with the fact that, uh, that the Picards are all um, English. And that's where their accent came from. <laughs> uh, as for Agnes and, and how that's all being handled, yeah, the manipulation is quite a big theme in this season, isn't it? Um, it is, it is really good that they're handling the, the issues that Renee is going through, especially because she seems to be a very high performing person in the description that we get from, uh, Talon. Uh, she's very high performing, really, really good at everything, but she does have her, her dark side, her, her, uh, difficulties with anxiety and depression. I think it's been re- uh, really well done in the, in the show, but yes, uh, Q putting on that really really fake accent i would presume that he got the job while he still had his powers maybe he clicked his fingers and was able to use a little bit of power to get himself into that position because otherwise it's uh it's people going hang on a second you're just putting on a sigmund freud accent uh that doesn't make you a mental health uh, professional <laughs> thanks so much heather Final piece of feedback on Facebook from Jamie Lawton, who says, nice to see Elia Thompson getting some screen time in front of the camera. Yeah, for some reason, I forgot to mention this when we were recording originally. I did have it on my notes as well. But of course, great to see Elia Thompson fronting that board who denies Adam Sung his investment uh, for continuing his research. Yeah, great to see her on screen, especially after doing two great episodes of Star Trek Picard as well. We'll close out the feedback with a voicemail from the wonderful Mr. Steve Brown doing a live Steve on Star Trek Picard Season 2, Episode 5. Take it away, Steve. Hello, TV Podcast Industries. This is Steve, and this is for uh, Picard Episode 6, Fly Me to the Moon. I'm so glad they do these recaps because I can't remember from one week to the next what I said in a voicemail or what happened on the show. I'm going to guess, because I haven't watched this yet, that Renee Picard, the astronaut, is the blonde woman that Q was trying to manipulate in the last episode. This one, directed by Jonathan Frakes, huh? Would it be called the Picard Vineyard in this day if they don't take residence until four centuries later? Ah, uh, so we do get Brent Spiner and Soji. I don't remember the actress who plays her, but interesting their roles in this world. Has Q placed them here? What's the, I don't know. Oh, maybe she's already a synthetic. Oh, okay, so she is human. She just has a dysgenetic defect. The question is, is this cure going to last or is it a temporary thing and she's got to take more of it? All the questions that he would be asking. Well, I guess it said 100% effective, so maybe it should be permanent? I don't know. Oh, she shot the Borg Queen. (laughs) She just happens to have skills in entry to early... What did she say? Uh, The song is playing. It's all in the subtitle. Mic drop. Fly me to the moon. Oh, what a cliffhanger ending. So the Borg Queen is inside her. You guys might be right that the Borg Queen we saw in episode one is Jurati. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks, Steve. Had the same thoughts for a very quick second that she could have been a synthetic, but uh, quickly corrected to say, no, she's not. So interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And I think with Chateau Picard, I think it's the ancient. So the Picards were the before. Yes. Um they retook up residence there, I guess. Absolutely. Um, and me- historical stuff, I guess. Yeah. Um, It'd be like, oh, look, they're over there in the old Murphy's farm where nobody's lived for a hundred years, but it's still called the Murphy's yeah, farm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and yeah, so, and I think you might be right um, that uh, Rene could have been the, the blonde haired woman the, uh, at the cafe. I hadn't really even clocked that. It was definitely the blonde haired woman. Yeah, I just hadn't yeah. clocked it. <laughs> just so it was a random woman enjoying the coffee. Yeah, no, it was definitely Rene Picard uh, that was outside the cafe. That's how. Yeah, I just uh, didn't uh, spot yeah. it. That's where Q uh, realizes that his powers don't work. So he obviously went off and got a job as a therapist yeah. uh, immediately afterwards. <laughs> yeah, connection just wasn't made, but absolutely, uh, completely see it now. Love it. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much, Steve, for, for your thoughts. And thank you to everyone who has provided their feedback in for episodes uh, of uh, Star Trek Picard. Uh, fellow Trekkies, keep them coming in. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yep. You can keep emailing us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com with any of your thoughts on any of the shows that we're covering. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Star Trek Picard. We cover loads and loads of shows in TV Podcast Industries, so make sure you stay subscribed to the podcast on tvpodcastindustries.com. This episode of TV Podcast Industries was brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Matt Murdock. Thanks so much, Matt, for your support. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt, for, for your support. Really, 
Really appreciated. Uh, if you want to support us on Patreon, you can support us for a monthly amount over at patreon.com forward slash TV podcast industries. Or if you'd like to support us with a one off donation, you can pop on over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash TVPI and buy us a coffee. And um, you can also stay subscribed to the podcast. And if you enjoy what you hear, why not share it with your friends? Because sharing the podcast is, of course, sharing the love. And any support, whatever form it takes, is really, really appreciated. Yes, it is. Thank you so much for all your support. We'll be back next week with Star Trek Picard Season 2, Episode 6. Your feedback on the episode. And, of course, our next question in our 10 Forward Pub Quiz. Hope you can join us then. Yes. And, of course, we will be returning to Marvel TV with the Moon Knight series starring Oscar Isaacs and Ethan Hawke. Uh, episode 2 arrives on April the 6th. So join us there over on our Defenders podcast where we'll be covering the second episode of the Marvel TV miniseries Moon Knight. Absolutely. First episode was excellent. If you want to hear our thoughts yeah. on that, you can get that on our main feed on tvpodcastindustries.com. Talk to you next week. Yes. Thanks so much, fellow Trekkies, for joining us. As always, it is a pleasure to chit-chat with you about all things Picard and all things Deep Space. Uh, remember, fellow Trekkies, keep watching, keep listening, and keep trekking. Bye. Bye.